Hi, my name is Paul Marco. Welcome to another episode of Techno Crime Fighters Forum. This is episode nine, if you're keeping track, and you should be keeping track. These things, uh, these things, we break uh, incredible information every week. Uh, if you're collecting these, I'm thinking of collecting them and putting them all on CD-ROM. There's bombshells. They're going to really be bombshells in about a year when people start to catch up to what's really going on and they can let go of the news and the puppet show that's going on on the mainstream media and most of the alternative media. Today, we have uh, just two panelists. We have Karen Milton Stewart and we have Dr. Millicent Black. Now, uh, a lot of people are new to this forum and it's very important that they know uh, what these panelists are going through, how they got to be targets, and who's currently targeting them. So before we really get into the program and uh, discuss the hardcore stuff, I'm going to have them both introduce themselves with a little bit of their background, and then we can go on to the, uh, the different subjects that they've been telling me they want to talk about, and I have some things in mind that I want to break. So let's start off with... Uh, Karen Milton Stewart. Karen, welcome to the podcast. Hi, uh, thank you. Would you tell us a little thank bit you, about Dr. Marco. marketing? All right. Um, I am basically here um, because the NSA decided to attack me for doing something that is was a intelligence analyst at the National Security Agency for 28 years. And at, at one point in time, in the later part of my career, I discovered that a series of uh, intelligence reports that I'd written, and it spanned about six months, a series of intelligence reports that I'd written that had received all kinds of awards and kudos were taken by the head of weapons in space and given to the, the um, promotion board. And he told them that an entirely different person had been responsible for this series of reports, which my own bosses had told me they estimated saved over 2,000 American military lives. So he misrepresented my work to a promotion board to get a woman he was sleeping with in the office promoted. And when I went to the IG, the IG decided that, and the IG was George Ellard, who actually was fired last year for taking uh, illegal retribution against whistleblowers. But when the series of events that would set me up and push me out the door based on falsified evidence and falsified accusations. And I found myself being stalked and harassed by NSA security in exactly the same protocol that was used by the East German police called Zersetzung, which means a deconstruction. And the deconstruction refers to every aspect of someone's life. So when their, their harassment um, got very extreme, meaning like poisoning a pet dog and killing it and doing uh, coordinated driving, uh, uh, aggressive driving uh, actions on the road to try to wreck me or kill me, I reported it and I said, you know, you've claimed that you have to investigate me. Well, that's all well and good. It's been going on three years. It's stalking harassment. It's not investigation because I have done nothing wrong and anybody competent could have found it way before now. Well, at that point, they pushed me out the door saying, oh, you're just are stalking and harassing you. And they even told the local police, you're not allowed to look at her evidence, her images or her license plates. You're not allowed to investigate. So they took over my, uh, constitutional rights and forbid them to me. So at a certain point in time, after they fired me, I set up a lawsuit and I am suing them with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And they have been desperate to get that taken off the books because it alleges the stalking harassment that, by the way, it looks like they were instrumental in creating throughout the United States. So they didn't want to be tied to it, but they were following the protocol themselves. So that very definitely ties them to it. Um, so this, this uh, lawsuit, they have not been able to shake. And in 2015, when I subpoenaed even more damning evidence against NSA and a certain NSA executive who burglarized my house, they absolutely had a fit. They came down to Florida where I had moved. And apparently 
told the Fusion Center, the FBI, and the Fusion Center vigilantes, who are called InfraGuard, that I was some kind of terrorist threat in order to get these people engaged in, yet again, vicious 24-7 stalking harassment. So um, after months of that, uh, I actually had a Twitter encounter with Bill Black Jr., who was retired NSA, and he was the deputy director of NSA during 9-11. And I, at that point in time on Twitter, I had given an interview with a radio blogger and, uh, hello, Catherine, hello. Uh, I'd given Hi, an Karen. interview with a radio blogger on Twitter and I told him what I knew about 9-11 because I said, you know what, I'm pissed. I have waited for years for this information to come out and they won't say it. And now they're stalking, harassing me illegal, illegally to sabotage a lawsuit that is my right to put, uh, basically to have. And so I told the interviewer, I said, I spoke to two separate NSA analysts years apart, both of whom told me exactly the same story, that they had everything they needed six months before 9-11 to stop it, and that not one person had to die. And when I posted this, I, I did the interview on radio blog, and then I posted the transcript, and uh, Bill Black Jr. apparently got wind of it and uh, got his Twitter account and was attacking me as being a troll. And I showed him my badge and I said, no, I worked there 28 years. I know exactly what I'm talking about. And at that point in time, he tweeted me. He said, that's all I need to know. And then uh, he had said, you better hope that I'm not the, the, the real Black Bill Black Jr. who was deputy director of NSA. And my response was, you know, so, you know, basically, so what? And uh, it's the truth, and I don't care who you are. And so he erased all of our uh, exchanges, and within a few days in November 2015, my home and my family started to get hit with directed energy weapons. So at that point in time, he was trying to uh, kill me, you know, because you're never, never ready for directed energy weapons, let me tell you, because the, the home, basically the... Um, the washing machine, the, I mean, the dishwasher, the oven, the refrigerator, all kinds of appliances were fried during the first uh, couple of days of attack. So that's how powerful they were. And um, only, I think only instincts uh, told me where to go in the house to be safe. And uh, I stayed away from the other people in the house so that they would not be harmed. And I was able to get through it. But it's been 24-7 ever since and we've come to find out that Bill Black Jr. and others setting up or letting 9-11 happen uh, if they didn't set it up actually but letting it happen for the purposes of power and money okay and we have since learned from further investigations that it would appear that the 9-11 victims had their identity stolen and insurance policies and trust funds and properties bought in their name in anticipation of their death by the very people who should have been protecting them. So there were fortunes made on 9-11 by these dirt bags. And to me, I, I do say I am targeted by Bill Black Jr. because the sequence of events to me is undeniable. And if I am to be killed, then I'm making that statement as a dying declaration that Bill Black Jr. and others of his ilk are behind what's going on with me and are behind what has gone on with a lot of people. So that's who I am. And I'm standing up and I'm saying it and I'm not going quietly because this affects thousands of people. Wow, that's so impressive. I, I don't know how you follow that, but I know that, uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, let's go over to Dr. Millicent Black. Now, she's been in the program, uh, I think, 27 years. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your history with the uh, target and asymmetric warfare. Millicent? Hi. This Hi. all started for me in 1996, actually, uh, when a cousin said to me, Millicent, they told us that we can blame anything on you. 1997, her sister said to me, it's called assimilated controlled warfare. Then she said, the devil is playing with your mind. And when he gets through playing with you, he's going to destroy you. And when they open you up after you're dead, they'll find that all of your organs have been stressed. 
keep in mind the word the words or the phrase destroy you at that point i was just kind of going through what looked like some emotional things i i had a marriage that ended i now know i was actually humanized to walk out of that marriage um within three months i was i was i guess remote controlled to quit my job now that didn't make sense it doesn't make sense to me now at that time i thought i was obeying god right not um because i was the only i was the, the head breadwinner and i had a daughter in college i had a grandchild who i was legal guardian for so it made no sense for me to quit a job at a major university that i needed the money to put to care for my family. But that's what I did. Again, not knowing what was happening. What I do know now is that the people around me, including those two women who told me that information in 1996 and 97, already knew that I had been selected for this program. Now, let me show you the deceptiveness of it all. It was set up in our area by a person who was then in the Air Force, who seemingly was telling people that this was a they were setting it up as spiritual warfare. So the people who were being quote unquote attacked in the night were being attacked by the devil and they were able to get free of him by fasting and praying. The only problem was that that never worked for me. My fasting and praying never got that to go away until finally in 1999, I was at home on a Saturday afternoon. Um, actually working in my hometown then took a $13,000 cut in pay to get a job in this area. Um, all of that was part of the setup because I was being set up in this area for people to use me for research, not just for research, but also for practice. Um, I got a call, an invitation to dinner. That invitation was for dinner with the man who I believe is responsible for me being in the program. He did reveal yesterday by submitting your messaging that the program actually is the torture program. So you see, that's not anything either that's being used under any, any regular basis, but surely all the news reports tell us that it is a crime against humanity. It is a war crime for those who are using it on just civilians. The ACLU has filed a lawsuit against James Elder Mitchell and John Jensen, uh, who are the two psychologists that were contracted by the CIA to design, implement, and oversee the agency's post-911 torture program. The person that is doing this to me was, it seems, exposed to the seer. And that's what's in everybody's ears right now in the news when torture is brought up, survival resistance escape and evasion is what seer stands for and uh jensen and mitchell are responsible for or being right now sued for the use of that kind of torture on victims who were being held in guantanamo bay so for the last well i'll, I'll go back 99 was this visit i ended up with this person um 2000, I had my first surgery, both little toes. I could not get rid of the pain under any circumstances. Surgery was the only answer. What the, the uh, issue was, the doctor said, was the little bones in the middle of the little toe. And so she removed them. That was to leave the toe spongy. I was to not have any pain ever again. I go for eight years with no pain. And all of a sudden, I start having pain again, not just having pain, but I received what I knew were shots to those areas of my little toes. 2001, I have a rotator tear, which takes me to another surgery, shoulder cut open. Um, I come away with what the MRI says was a metallic artifact. I had a doctor my primary care physician said to me, I wish you had told me you were gonna have surgery on that shoulder under workers' comp. She said, I would have told you to use your own insurance because workers' comp is a tool of the devil. Uh, this is April, this is February, 2001. April, 2003, I'm driving down my highway 
and I hear a, man vo a man's voice say, they can see through your eyes. Quick, don't read the road signs. At that point, I was, I guess, um, alerted that something else maybe happened to me during surgery, but I was already suspicious because I got a call from one of my coworkers while I was recovering from the shoulder surgery. And she said, oh, I'm just out in the backyard looking up at the stars. I now know that she was tell, trying to, to warn me that perhaps satellites were on me. Satellites are also called stars. Um, then I start having problems with my left hand. When I have surgery on the left hand, it's to remove the thumb joint. Now, the most si significant these removals is that it's always my, they call them the basilar joint, B-A-S-L-A-R joint. Now, that doesn't make sense, does it? I, I don't ever hear about that. Have any of you ever heard about a basilar joint giving people problems? So it was in 1995, the basilar joint in my right hand was removed. That surgeon refused workers' comp. He said, I don't deal with workers' comp. So now we, we are over in 2001, and now it's the basilar joint of my left hand. Uh, this doctor takes that joint out, and it seems he left a little present in there for me. Uh, I, in, in February of this year, I went to surgery to try and get that little present removed. And the doctor literally opened my hand, tapped on that thing in my hand. I had an x-ray that showed it. Uh, a radiology tech pulled me into a room in 2011. He says, come here, let me show you this pen in your hand. And he literally showed it to me and then printed it off for me. So I, I took it to her. She was going to remove it. She tapped on it, said, I can't remove it if a doctor put it in it. Hey, what she says is scar tissue. I've yet to find out if what she cut away is anything that's significant. But I do know that she closed my hand and that, that area is still, is still there. So we've gone through now October 2001 with something else being put in my body um april well, let's say let's say very quickly we're talking about two different protocols we're talking about a slow kill protocol with directed energy weapons being used on some people and with other people unfortunately like dr millicent black there is a implant illegal implantation torture and experimentation program going on with other americans so we're talking at least two different protocols Actually, um, I, would just, I would like to speak just to support everything that Millicent said so far. Absolutely everything. For, I think for people who hear it the first time, um, it sounds incredible, but everything she says, I've since heard from many victims, and I spent the last week working with another victim who experienced something very similar. So the only thing I would like to add, if anything, Absolutely. is everything global. We have a global program. Um, and just, just very briefly, Melissa, could you maybe put down the, the camera because I think it's sliding up and it's shaking when you're speaking. If you just put it on It's so difficult for me to hold this thing. Um, I'm actually holding the uh, a tablet because when I was on the computer, remember how he messed up the computer, messed up the sound, yeah. messed up the visual. So, protocols. I have the military medical experimentation piece of it, and I also have the slow pill. In 2008, when this, this person retired, and I began to hear him talk in the night, he didn't say to me, I'm going to kill you as slowly as possible. And I also have, I do have the directed energy weapon. In 2008, when this, this person retired, and I began to hear him talk in the night, you all hear that? Say to me, I'm going to kill you slowly as possible. Yeah, feedback, reverberation, echo. Paul, could you switch off your micro? I think this is it's called. Yeah. Is that okay now? Yeah, please, please continue. I think it's okay now. I think it's better. So then we go through, I, I go through the rest of 
of um, okay. Go through the rest of two thousand two thousand one. And January 2002, I step off of a ladder in my bedroom and twist my knee. When I go to get that x-ray, they find that both knees were bad. And I end up in August of 2002 having bilateral knee, re knee replacement surgery. And just before the bilateral knee replacement surgery took place, in June of 2002, my right shoulder had to have surgery again. The surgeon says to me, as soon as I come out of surgery, he said, you keloid easily, don't you? And I said, no, I don't keloid at all. Turns out that's another location where an implant had been placed. And maybe that was his way of telling me that something else had happened to me. What's significant about all of this? Now I've got at least, I've had three surgeries that were paid for by workers' comp, two other surgeries that were not. And it's a sense that in all of those surgeries, something was placed in my body. Mindy, I'm about to send over to you an extra, it's actually a bone scan. Uh, you, can play, you can put it up on the screen because it shows areas that are undeniable, the places where I've been implanted. Is this it? Or are you sending me something different? Okay. Wait a second. Including my pubic, my pubic Give bone. Just a second, because I think, um, Paul, um, I think we still get um, transmissions from your microphone. Maybe switch off your microphone. Fantastic. Sorry. Sorry, Millicent. Okay. So what I've just sent to Mindy by email. It's a copy of a bone scan that was ordered by a orthopedic doctor in Dayton, Ohio, and it was taken at a major hospital. That bone scan shows all of the areas where there are actual implants, not just the little things that Melinda Kidder picked up on, but also actual things, including my right jaw, my, my uh, left wrist, both knees, the top of both feet, my pubic bone. And in all of any of these areas, I am tortured. I am severely tortured. I have lost teeth from my mouth as a result of being hit in those areas uh, on both sides. I've had teeth cracked and chipped. It's just unconscionable the things that have been done to, to me as a result of those, uh, those objects. And I mean, this is actually being picked up by a scan in a hospital. I'm not talking about what Melinda Cuter found, which was even more than that. Okay. Uh, Millicent, would you like to say who's doing this? Well, I mean, not the name, but uh, the agencies involved. There are four branches of the military, four branches Air Force, Army, Navy, Marines, three major universities, including my former employer. Uh, and I'm not calling those names because I, I do hope to get into some legal litigation surrounding it, especially those areas where I had workers' comp paid surgeries with a medical doctor saying that that is a tool of the devil, meaning that's how they take their victims into these programs, especially the ones where telemetry and satellites are used. Um, I have had the testing that does identify telemetry in my body. There are at least five. Um, DOD contractors that are also using the frequencies that have been been picked up on from my body and from that inf from that the uh, what's called a body area network is what you all see in that X in that x-ray from uh, that many put up on the screen of those DOD contractors Lockheed Martin is one of them the person that I believe set me up for this program also has Con has um, an association with Lockheed Martin. So you see, they just cross. But for me, I'm, I'm making billions of dollars for someone. I understand that once you put into this kind of program, it costs five to $10 million a year. I have been in it for at least 14 years because that's how long it's been since the first surgery. 
and and that was the first workers comp surgery it's been 17 years now since the first surgery where there are also implants in those toes so you see you you don't know yeah. i do know that the people around here all were very anxious when i would go to have surgeries and I, I did not know that the person with whom i was personally involved and who is now an air force retiree was actually the one that set me up for the surgeries because once he put his things in my body he was able to direct the energy to those areas to wear out my joints to, to direct pain rays and so trying to get rid of the pain is what forced me to the surgery so it became just a circle a vicious circle that's quite an introduction uh you say it's 10 million a year uh, I was doing some research last week and found out that Guantanamo Bay detainees, whatever they call them, they're basically mostly innocent citizens, just picked up on a sweep, uh, cost seven million. So this program to the American taxpayer is even more expensive than the atrocity that we call Guantanamo Bay. Uh, so let's thank you very much, Millicent. Uh, Every time I hear your story, I just, I'm amazed more. And I've heard it a couple times now, and I'm looking forward to Ramola's detailed outline or a description of the whole thing. Catherine, welcome to uh, Techno Crime Fighters Forum 9. Okay. Uh, I, I would like to have uh, you give the same kind of introduction. Tell us how they threw you in the program and who's Who's torturing you now? Yeah, so as uh, like all the other ladies, I also have a very interesting story because um, I um, got put in the program overtly because I think I think we begin to find out that all of us have been marked in the past for the possibly. I think this is what I um, begin to suspect from looking at very very many victim cases. But I've been overtly put into the program quite demonstratively so in November two thousand and eleven. And I started, I, um, I changed fields. I'm originally a particle physicist and I started studying human systems, complex human systems, especially the English court system. That was my first case study and I attended a high profile court case. And um, MI5 started demonstratively stalking me. And it took me absolutely years to figure out um, what this program is and that I've been put into a program because um, it's actually made, it's drawn up to simulate, emulate um, the, the kind of terror watch lists. So MI5 started overtly stalking me, but of course it wasn't normal surveillance that they were doing. Very quickly it turned into mock surveillance, so um, people were demonstratively following me in the street and so on. Um, and I was also stalked by high profile people who appeared over and over. Um, there were quite outrageous scenes. I've been stalked um, by the same person in, in two to three countries. Um, so uh, in summary, I mean, I, I don't want to make my story too long because um, I also, it's also repeating. What happened to me in a nutshell is that I, I was um, stalked for many years overtly. I couldn't get rid of my stalkers. They followed me from Britain to um, Germany and then to Switzerland. I had break-ins into my home. I had miscellaneous sabotage. My businesses were destroyed. Um, they were infiltrated. And um, for a long time, I didn't figure out what was going on. But every single business person I got into um, contact with trying to launch my own business turned out to be an infiltrator and then proceeded to absolutely mock me for my endeavor and um, this is something that's absolutely un incomprehensible to anybody who doesn't understand what this program actually is so eventually I just sat down and I did some research to find out what exactly is going on and what's happening and then I also started to be brutally attacked when I start tried to launch my second business so my my story in a nutshell is that um, on the surface I've been um, stalked by MI5 by German intelligence and then by Swiss intelligence in series by their human surveillance network and I started being um, overtly physically attacked um, by German intelligence and then by Swiss intelligence non-stop with the directed energy weapons. But going back, I also suspect that some very strange medical issues, skin rashes, I started having just after, a few months after my um, targeting also have something to do with it. And um, now I'm being mutilated non-stop um, across um, country boundaries. I've been shot at from electromagnetic guns um, placed in cars. 
in handbags, in, on planes, on trains, absolutely everywhere. And meanwhile, um, one of my main stalkers has appeared several times. Um, also, I mean, I had outrageous satanic messages and death threats and assassination attempts. And I spent a very, very long time trying to make sense of what actually is going on. And um, what I did is I founded um, a joint investigation group, which has the, the two ladies present, Karen Melton Stewart and Dr. Melissa Black, as well as um, Ramola D, um, who isn't here today, and Melanie Richan in Belgium. And um, I was working with them trying to investigate this. And um, what we've now uncovered is um, to cut to the chase that this is a program, as the ladies before me explained. It, is, um, it has several layers and several layers of, of cons and fakery. At first, ostensibly, it seems to be an anti-terror list. Then it turns out that it actually is a blacklist and people on it have horrific things done to them. Then looking at it more closely, it seems to be a human experimentation program. But then looking at it yet more closely, it turns out that none of the things done to the, to the victims have any resemblance of human experimentation or any sort of scientific endeavor. And the torturers know exactly what they're doing. And it seems to be a systematic, very, um, very, very sexualized, mutilation program of predominantly women who are slowly mutilated to death and i think the best um st state of knowledge i have now is that i've been put into a program whereby um an inner organized crime cartel that seems to have put all the intelligence agencies in the western world into deep capture is running systematic mutilation programs of women who are then um use this for business plans in various ways. So Karen um, mentioned, for example, the um, fraudulent life insurances that we've discovered made out in victims' names. Um, Dr. Melissa Black mentioned, for example, our data, the bio data of the chips being used by universities and um, defense contractors and military um, people. Um, but there's also, um, I think, other business plans, which is simply the sexual exploitation of women. All the female victims experience sexual um, assault, um, remote electronic rape, and, and brutal, you know, sometimes genital um, mutilation. And I'm also one of them. Um, so um, this is this is now the story of my targeting, and it comes up to today. So I'm um, I'm I'm also a consultant. I'm a systems analyst, and um, what I'm now doing full time is I work for the joint investigation team, and um, I am investigating these crimes. Um, in the total absence of um, any police force and any police investigation. So um, that is me. Um, we also discovered that the police um, services don't just um, ignore crimes um, committed with these implants and nanotechnology and micro or electromagnetic weapons. They actively attack the victims, which is a ten telltale sign of deep capture in the police force. So um, the Western police forces are in deep capture by organized crime. So are the intelligence agencies who are even deeper in deep capture. I can also confirm that um, actually quite large parts of the judiciary are also in deep capture. So um, my role is um, essentially as, as the founder of this joint investigation team, I'm trying to, to assist governments um, and, and um, organizations to move out of deep capture. Meanwhile, I'm being mutilated and I'm fighting for my life like all the other ladies. So um, that is, that, that's me. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Catherine Horton. Now, before you joined us, Catherine, uh, Karen was Karen and Melissa were kind of outlining how, where they wanted to take this broadcast. So, Karen, would you like to lead the? Uh... Okay, I will just tell you a couple of things that I uh, have uh, done this week, and uh, I would encourage people to try, 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 try. You know, no matter who you are, where you are, because you never know where and when a breakthrough will come through. Um, I have a couple good leads. I contacted the head of uh, one of the militias, American militias, um, and uh, gave him a, a synopsis of what was going on. I could read that, but uh, at some point, but um, he wrote back immediately because I, I told him what was going on. And I said, look, if you guys think that you're going to defend the homeland with guns and bullets, 
you need you need to investigate what I'm going to be telling you because we are being already attacked with asymmetrical covert warfare and people are dying. I said this is a this is a fight you guys need to learn about and get into. And then I sent him all kinds of links to you know uh, World Beyond Belief and other articles and interviews. And uh, within a few hours, he actually wrote back to me saying. Um, uh, too, and that he would be getting back to me this afternoon calling me and we could talk. So I'm very optimistic that this person may be able to alert and influence militias across the United States to look into what is going on with targeted people in their state. And I said, you know, these people who are attacking us are such rank cowards that what would happen if one of these real brave men who hide behind a thousand other men with covert weapons you can use at a distance, what if five or 10 real men came to their door and said, we know what you're doing, stop it or else. So that's, that's promising, I hope. And uh, a second thing is that I got in touch with a certain uh, ACLU uh, organization in a certain state, and I'm not going to name where, and uh, told them about myself and what is going on, and they actually reached out and, uh, and said, tell us more. So I know that a lot of people in the ACLU, different organizations across the nation, have been scared off. They have been threatened and told to ignore this, but uh, this this is somebody who has written about national security issues, and I'm hoping this person will follow through and use at least part of it, if not all of it, and then we can maybe rally the, the ACLU to actually do something. So again, these are a couple leads, and I'm hoping something will come uh, out of these leads. And like I said, I just keep p telling people, don't give up. Keep pounding on those doors, because God knows where the open door is going to be. That's right. That's the truth. Very good. So, where do we go from here? Well, uh, let me, I Milton, think Millicent should be next because I think she was about ahead. to say something. Let me do share about some of the things that I've done, some of the people that I've contacted. Um, I've had some amazing responses. Unfortunately, they haven't brought it to an end. But I started off by contacting. Um, the Joint Non-Lethal Weapons Directorate in Quantico, Virginia. I wrote them, I, I actually called, I called and got a guy on the phone. I told him what was happening to me. I told him about my relationship with that retired, at that point, uh, 2011 was the year retired Air Force person. He said, send me a email. He said, I'll check. And when I contacted him again to get the information back, he said, I've checked. You are not an enemy combatant. There are no rules of engagement concerning you. And there's no human use protocol concerning you. He says, so we're not doing it. But it doesn't mean that the DOJ or the D. Oh, what's the other one? The, or the DOD, I guess, isn't. No, DOJ, D. DOD, Department no, of Defense. Okay, the DOJ or the FBI. He said, doesn't mean that the DOJ or the FBI isn't using you for research. He did not say using you for research, but isn't using you. So, but since then, Melinda Kidder has done a global uh, watch, terrorist watch list um, search, and she says, your name isn't there. So you're not on anybody's list. So it's not the DOD, the DOJ, or the FBI. Um, now, the person that supposedly put me in the program is trained in seer torture and because of that i have been victimized by it and his training is remotely and so there is a picture from an air force research laboratory manual that shows the body of what could be a woman the entire body is circled off into joints and there's a number there and my understanding is they can put that number in a computer, send it to a satellite, and that person will be struck in that exact location. That's how the remote torture is done. Um, in addition to all the other locations where they can put a, a, an implant in your body or a chip of, of whatever kind they use, um, Melinda calls them wave guides. And that just is a place, uh, a, 
an object that guides a wave, whether it's a microwave, a radio, um, x-ray, a gamma ray, you know, it just guides the wave to that location of the human body. And there you have, after that, you have inflammation. From the inflammation could become the necrotic tissue. From the necrotic tissue becomes cancer. That's why it's so important to keep the body hydrated and also to take any of the natural supplements that help your body to rid itself of the ex of the radiation exposure. There's so many ways they have that they are torturing not just women, but also children. And indeed, Catherine is right. They are setting women and children up for sex uh, slavery. I am in contact with three women over the age of 60. All of them are being used in one way or the other for, for human trafficking for sexual purposes. One of them is electronic rape and whether they are broadcasting her by, by television or some other uh, Telly wave, I, I'm not sure. The other one seems they seem to be hypnotizing her in her bed at night and coming in and raping her in her bed. She said, I wake up and there are my hair is fixed and I have makeup on, and I don't know how that happened. So you see, law enforcement is confirming to her that this is happening and that there is a huge market for women in her age range. Come on now, a huge market for women in sex slavery in, the, in their 60s. So you see, it's extremely, extremely um, serious going on. Seriousness. Military training is being used now to open sex markets. And, and not just, you know, it's not just for entertainment, but it's for money. It's for pay. So we have to really, really continue to get the word out that things are happening and things are happening in an extremely uh, accelerated way to exacerbate the criminality in our nation. I have just sent to Mindy a, a, a picture of my head, of the top of my head, and you can see actually the burns in the top of my head where I am being, having the V2K nonstop. Uh, there's also on that picture that I sent to her a uh, copy of an EEG that shows the erratic waves that, and that particular these particular EEGs are during the daytime so it shows how much my brain is invaded day and night I have sleep studies that have been done uh, two in Tennessee one in Ohio and it shows that they don't miss a beat my brain is never without someone communicating vocally to it um, and so how can you think? How can you live a normal life? How can you make rational decisions? And all, I have to tell all of you, um, it is by the grace of God that I was able to finish a doctoral program, that I was able to go through the research and the examinations and the meetings and all of the concentration that it took to read the articles and to read the books, to glean the information. My um, my, my doctoral dissertation, by the way, was on empowering the church, educating the church to empower women who suffer in silence from domestic abuse, a journey to, to recovery. And, then, uh, the, and the recovery includes the recovery of the voice of the woman who's been silenced. Um, I, I, I chose that subject mainly because of what's happening in America. The police department, when I, when I called them and said, I have proof that someone has put a chip in my heart, y'all, they convinced my children to, to have me committed, or oh, well, to quote unquote, to have me examined uh, because my behavior had been strange, they said. Um, by then, I'd already been accepted to a doctoral program and was just waiting on the program to start. So it's, it's incredible what they can get away with. And it's incredible the, the way they can manipulate people to cooperate with their quote unquote program. Let me just throw something in here, Millicent. I'm sure this is a lot about women because they make better sex slaves. Not that there aren't male sex slaves because there certainly are. But we'll get comments that men are in this program too. And I do get uh, emails from men every day uh, that are going through this too. So it's not exclusively women. 
Right. But I read I read somewhere that it's like seventy percent women. Right. Uh, do you think? Uh, so, yeah. Continue. I just before we get to comment, I just thought I'd throw that in. So I just would like to throw in one more thing. Also, a lot of the victims are murdered, and I rather suspect that a higher rate of men is also murdered. Um, wow. because because they want to get rid of them, business competitors, or just get rid of um, other men um, who might become dangerous, dangerous as in just helping to solve the crime. And that might right. skew statistics as well. But um, so we, we know we shouldn't ignore the men. I'm just saying that um, when it's about ongoing torture, then you're absolutely right, 70 to 80% are women. I've, I um, emphasized women always, and I get a lot of complaints from men, and I want to just say that every time we do that, if we do not ignore the men, I'm just trying to highlight the high sexual aspect because a high female um, victim ratio is indicative of sexual violence. It's not indicative of paranoia or schizophrenia because that's 60 percent men, and it's also not indicative of human experimentation because there should be 50 50 men and women for you know a, um, a balanced scientific um, inquiry. So I just emphasize this not to ignore the men, but to just emphasize the sexual violence component that you know Millicent is also talking about. I completely agree with that. Men are also used to sex slaves. That needs to be said. Absolutely. Also, uh, let's go to the torture aspect by itself. Somebody who is able to do this torture is obviously a psychopath, maybe a Satanist, but certainly a psychopath because normal people can't do this. Normal people can inflict this kind of pain on another human being without feeling some empathy, without having some remorse. But these creatures obviously don't have that. And if you take the, torture takes the lid off. If you'll do torture, what won't you do? Uh, gas people uh, in, in Syria, change documents, uh, these puppets that you're seeing at the government, you know, the Trump firing Comey and all, they're all psychopaths because they'll, they are complicit in all of these torture programs. If they're not blowing the whistle, then they're complicit. So I think torture, when we get to the point where we're uncovering torture, and now we're uncovering it to a large segment of the population, there's millions of people that are going through what these three people are going through. And all of us are being impregnated with smart dust through the chemtrails, they're putting an astral net over the planet. We're all in the program. And there's nothing they won't do. If they'll do torture, there's nothing, nothing's off the table. So I think the human race is in, excuse my language, deep shit at this point. So uh, anyway, that's my two cents on that. No, I'm in full agreement. You know, this is, uh, an extinction event, you know, because there are psychopaths who think because they have all the money in the world that they're gods. And as gods, they can decide what the little people, uh, what can be done to or with the little people. And it's just hubris. It's pride on a level never seen before. And it's just because you have money, you have the right to take or twist or pervert uh, or damage some other human being's life. No, you don't. Never. And you never will. But these people think it. And even though when you talk to the police or you talk to other people, they say, well, why would anybody do that? And I say consistently, how do I, as a normal person, explain the mind of a psychopath? They are doing it and you need to brace for it. You need to get ready for it. Because if you sit there and try to figure out in a normal logic, why would somebody do this? They're going to be twiddling your thumbs when they come and take you. So know that psychopaths don't think the way that we do. And there is no explaining it. It's not logical. But I, it's I, what they believe. You know what? I absolutely, completely want to underline that. You are 100% Karen. And the way I try to explain it to people is, is to say, look, you're not dealing with somebody normal. And then name you know, some locally known serial killer. 
to name a you know, serial killer who's known widely in the US and here um, you know, in Europe or in Britain, for example, it would be well you're doing with, you are dealing with Fred and Rose West. These are pro prolific child killers. Are you going to ponder before you arrest Fred and Rose West why they you know, entrap children and mutilate and torture them to death? No, you're just gonna actually arrest them. No one cares why they're doing it. It's because they're sick in the head. And I think the one missing element that um, we haven't discussed is how come so many psychopaths are in these upper echelons because we see the same, exactly the same development in um, the big um, revelations about pedophilia and, and you know, child torture, these pedo-satanists and, and you know, everywhere around the world. And the reason why it is, is so global, it's because, and now I'm saying it, and I think everything we'll discover will underline it, is that um, these people have been promoted on purpose. There are two effects. One of them is um, the one that Paul um, um, pointed out, you know, the natural accumulation of psychopaths at the top. Um, you know, he called pyramid organization psychopaths magnets, and I think that's entirely correct. And there was a, a second enhancing um, um, a factor here, and that is that a, 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 a huge cartel that has been identified in 2011 by um, Swiss, Swiss systems analysts and mathematicians that owns, I think, 40% of all the global corporations has been trying to buy governments and police forces, especially intelligence agencies, um, by putting people there who have very strong control files. And the, the strongest control files are pedophilia, and serial killing and necrophilia. So this is why we now wake up as humanity and we discover that the top people in government, top, sometimes top lawyers, sometimes judges, um, anybody who's systemically, systemically important to a, an organized crime cartel actually has um, these criminal aspects to them. They had to have them to wow. be promoted there, to be allowed to go there wow. by this crime cartel. So it's not by accident wow. at all that we see this, you know, because everything Millicent described about the FBI and, and the, the military in the US is one-to-one -one mirrored about the intelligence agencies, the police in Belgium, in Germany, in the UK, in Switzerland, as I discovered to my horror. Um, it is everywhere. I've got e absolutely identical reports from South Africa, you know, from Japan, from Poland. It's everywhere. Right. And that's the missing link. So now we, we, it's, um, no one can say this is a conspiracy theory because this huge organized crime cartel has been scientifically uncovered. And, um, you know, Every day we get more and more to know about it. But the key thing to understand is that this is a, it is a corporation. It's a business. It's a private business. And it's been trying to subvert democracies and governments, I, actually for centuries, but it, it's really heated up, you know, throughout the 20th century. And it has huge um, successes, actually, because I think now we're discovering that the entire First and Second World War was an asset stripping exercise by this corporation. This is, you know, it's as shocking as it sounds, everything that was, you know, supposed military um, reasons or politics was actually a, a, a puppet show. And the situation we're in now, I think, is that this corporation, this global corporation, this cartel, is again trying to do a big asset stripping exercise after it has asset stripped pretty much um, Africa, Latin America, and the Middle East. Now it's coming to Europe, you know, now it's coming home so to speak, and now it wants to clear the deck. So, you know, I, I talked about this program, you know, uh, uh, for a long time and, and what I think is underlying this, but um, I think this aspect explains why what Millicent, um, you know, Millicent, um, Karen and Ramola are in three different US states. Melanie Richan is in Belgium and I've experienced of identical things in the UK, Germany and Switzerland. How can this be? How can it be that all of five women, we, it's to the letter identical what we're experiencing. It's because it's the same program. So there has to be an entity that's running it that is, um, it's uh, supranational. It's bigger than a nation. And, and that is the only entity known in the world that has this scale. So we can safely say that what we're dealing with is business plans by this corporation this global corporation that has put all of our governments 
and especially our intelligence agencies and police forces into deep capture. And it could put these things into these entities into deep capture, especially the intelligence agencies, because they're secretive. And that's how we all hang together. Um, what Karen saw when she first came up and what um, Bill Binney and Kirk Wiebe saw is the identical deep capture of NSA through this global corporation, I think. They saw just different tentacles of the beast. What I saw in the UK when MI5 started stalking me for no good reason and started trafficking me for the sexual delectation of what looked like retired MI5 agents, MI6 agents, that was this corporation. It was a business plan by this corporation. So um, I think this is what we're dealing with. And um, so what I would like to report also for my last week um, is that I have worked now the last two weeks with Melanie Richan in Belgium. Um, it was very interesting. And um, so uh, what she also told me about is, is past scanning sessions that she did. And Millicent mentioned, for example, that children are being attacked. And I can confirm now, Melanie Richan said that in past scanning sessions, they found chips in young children and will, you know, bring her on. She's part of the team, so she will bring, I will bring her on and she can explain in detail. But she had um, single moms, usually the intelligence agencies attack single mothers because they are vulnerable and for other reasons. Um, and she said when, when she had, she had a lot of um, young mothers come and say, I'm being stalked and harassed and I think my child might be chipped. They scanned the child and in all cases, they found chips in the child as well. So imagine these, these, um, intelligence agencies, they take entire families. And, and it's not just that, the audacity of the intelligence agencies was that um, I, for example, when I started being shot into in January 2016, I heard about the court case of Philip Kerr versus MI5, and I traveled to London for that. Now, MI5 amused themselves with um, sending their you know, young trainee agents to um, harass me and, and essentially talk to me and, and make fun of me, but also talk about the targeting quite openly to my face. And what one of these agents said to me is that, well, you know, it's, it's done by the Freemasons, which is kind of true because the Freemasons are entirely infiltrated by MI5 um, in, in the UK. So Freemasons, Freemasonry and MI5 in the UK are synonymous because they cross infiltrate. Um, but she said they take entire families. They take entire families. And then she smiled at me. Um, at the time, I didn't know that my sister would also be, you know, stalked and harassed. Oh, sorry, no, by that time I did know, but I, you know, I, I wasn't prepared for her also being systematically attacked. Um, but since then, my family has been systematically attacked. And, and MI5 basically sent a trainee agent to say to me, um, you know, point it out to me that, yes, they will attack my family as well, my entire family. And, you know, Millicent had a similar experience. I think Ramola had a similar experience and, and certainly Melanie as well. So these people are totally degenerate, you know, absolutely, Paul, you're absolutely right. And, and Karen, these people are mentally ill and we cannot apply, first of all, the normal standards of normal behavior. People have to understand that if you want to check if a, if a victim statement is, sounds um, kind of credible, you always have to have the mental image of a serial killer. These people are talking about a serial killer. Does it make sense that a serial killer would do that? And you can tell, actually many elements that victims report have telltale signs of serial killers. Obsessiveness, obsessive stalking, slow torture, enjoying it, a sexual element, all these features are always there. Um, but I would just like to finish off um, by saying that um, when I was in Belgium, Melanie Richan was, um, and this again underlines the sexual component, she has implants all over her body, including in her um, inner thighs. And when we had the meeting of a human rights charity, Ikato, she, her, her thighs were burned during the meeting. Mm. They were actually burned. They, they heated the chips, and then after the meeting, she actually confided that you know she was in agony and she showed me the burns and her inner thighs you could see fresh burns so this is how degenerate they are but you know the sexual element is you know is not lost on anyone here and they did the same thing the next day we together we went and um reported it to the police i wrote a six-page police report the police um 
first they lost my email and then we sent it again we went in person and then we got through to a very nice woman who actually works with melanie and she's been handling her case and then she came out and she said to our face listen as a police we do not have the means to do anything about it this has to go to the attorney general you know and we took the entire case and on i think it was wednesday yes wednesday no sorry tuesday on Tuesday, we submitted the entire case to the Belgian Attorney General. Um, and we will take it further. You know, we also talked to a lawyer who didn't seem extremely enthusiastic taking the fight on. But since then, we also, um, you know, had ideas of how we can proceed. But I'm, I'm telling everybody, you know, the, the time is running out and it is extremely urgent. I'm so glad, Karen, that you're reporting this about the um, militia because um, I, I hope they hear what we're saying today because they have to understand that time's running out. You know, in a sense, the corporation, as far as I can tell, the corporation is trying to kick off World War III for asset stripping purposes, and they are fast, you know. And as far as I can tell, they put every person of integrity and worth into this mutilation and torture program. A lot of the men have also been mutilated. They've lost limbs sometimes, you know. They've had car accidents and they also died. But what we're having is a situation where the best people of civil society are being tortured or murdered. Meanwhile, the corporation is, is hoovering off all the psychopaths and corrupts and pedophiles, putting them into high places, and is trying to take down our governments. That's as far as I can tell. But now the status quo from me is that, you know, um, the, the, the Belgian attorney general received the file. Um, I will send more information as well later on. Um, we tried to also do scanning with Melanie and we found chips in my body. I've got a chip in my neck, on the top of my head, in my ears, just like Melanie. She also informed me that the locations where they put chips is identical in every person. She's now, you know, seen the scans of many, many people. So this is a systematic program. But in reverse, if we find out where the chips are, we can very quickly find them in all people. You know, and that's what we're working towards. So um, I was very, I traveled to Brussels from Zurich um, last week and then this week, and I just came back yesterday, um, or rather this morning at 3 a.m. But um, this is it. So we are building a protocol of how to find these chips. And I'm so grateful for the work that Millicent has done because she also managed to find the really deep lying chips in the joints. And that is absolutely stellar research work, you know. That's, that's an absolute bombshell because Millicent has got, I think, a, you know, a portfolio of, of five or so different tests that people can do. You know, I mean, you can name, uh, name them again, Millicent. You had the sleep study and then I think also inflammation tests and stuff like that, right? Can you just list them, all the things you did? I, I, I've done absolutely the sleep study. Uh, neurologists can do EEGs during the daytime, which can also track the amount of radio frequencies you know, communication that happening to your brain. I've had, um, gee, I, I've had to have the CT scans and the MRIs because of the, the pain and the difficulties that I have. Uh, once, I, once the chip was found in my heart, then a medical doctor ordered a CT scan of my upper chest. They found that there are what they call calcified and non-calcified nodules. And she explained that to me recently. She said, when the body identifies something that's foreign in it, the first thing it does is begin to come around it and tissue is there. She said, but the longer it stays, that tissue begins to calcify. So then it makes like um, a hard shell to make sure that it stays contained. So they have found both uh, calcified calcified and non-calcified nodules in my heart, in my lungs, in my spleen, in my, uh, at number 10 of my rib cage, uh, and also in my gallbladder. So you see, those are areas where things have been placed in my body. And, and most recently, my right breast is now of concern. My thyroid has been of concern for the last three or four years. Um, there is something definitely behind my voice box that no one is willing to acknowledge. I've had an ENT go down and look at it, and he says, yeah, you do have inflammation in that area. Well, what causes inflammation? You know, they know that. Um, 
I sent over to Mindy a, a copy of the back of my body scan that Melinda Kidder did. And you can see all of the implants in my legs that are actually used for torture. Mindy, if you could flash that up on the screen, let them see, especially my legs and around my knees. Did you receive it, Mindy? Did we lose them? Is that the is that the body scan we had um, up on the on the image just uh, um, just up on the screen a moment ago? Is that the, the no, whole body no. scan? Right. This is this is the body scan that was oh, actually done by Melinda Kidder. Look at the back of my thighs. So when I'm sitting working, when I'm sitting driving six hours between Ohio and Tennessee or to West Tennessee to the doctor, which is three and a half hours, or to Atlanta, Georgia, where I had the surgery, which is four and a half hours. The backs of my legs are being heated. And when I stand, it hurts like everything. Notice they're in the backs of my arms. So when I rest my arm on the armrest, on the way, you know, while I'm driving the car, he can be burning and have burned the, the bottom of my arm right below my elbow. You see those, uh, there are implants in both shoulders. And so they can actually be used to, to prevent me from being able to raise my arms or to assimilate a, a rotator tear when there really is none. Right. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me interject something here. Uh, what we're being asked in the uh, chat is where can you get these scans? That was, that was a question that... Uh, Catherine might want to answer. And also, uh, Millicent, are these being uh, put into you when you sleep or when you're awake? How do you think they're getting there? These that you're seeing on the, on the body scan, I, I, I believe the, the person that set me off of the program, he takes responsibility. And he said that I stayed the night in a room with him. He said that night I loaded your body with microchips. I put them everywhere I could think of. Notice the one in the, in the, uh, on the right back. That's my right kidney. Um, yeah. Now that, that particular, this particular body scan was done by a private investigator in Columbia, Missouri named Melinda Kidder. Um, Sometimes if there are a group of people that want to have a scan done in the same location, she will go to them and they would just share the cost of her travel expenses. Otherwise, you can do as I did. I drove to Columbia, Missouri, and she did the body scan. She also now does a thermal scan that also shows, confirms her findings because the thermal scan will show areas of, of um, hot spots in the body. And when those hot spots are showing up in the exact same location as where she finds what she calls a waveguide, then that's a clear indication that there's a chip there. Um, Somebody's saying GMOs is one way they get in there. Uh, somebody in the chat is saying that GMOs is another way to get them in there. Uh, well, yeah, I've, well, I've heard of um, you, you go for surgery, you get loaded up. You uh, go to sleep or become unconscious from having your room or your house gassed. You get certain chips put in you. I've even heard of someone, uh, my dog, um, getting sharp shot. Yeah, I think that uh, didn't Catherine, didn't you say you were shot and Melissa was shot? Uh, no, Ramola was shot. Yeah, so um, I think, you know, actually another thing um, to, um, to um, keep in mind is that when you have these chips in the neck and you don't know the, that, they can also just set off the chip and give you one burst of intense pain and then you think you've been shot. But actually, just, they just set off a chip. So now that I've actually found the chip emitting in my neck, I, I have to check first, you know, I have to, we have to localize it exactly where the chip is so that I, from memory, I can, I can, you know, figure out if I was actually shot somewhere or if this was the chip being set off. So that's another thing. But um, certainly what I had is, um, you know, um, at one point, I think I was really sharp shot with something into my upper arm because when I turned back, um, there was a guy who was dragging something out of the hedge that I just walked past when my arm was, I think, shot into. Then he put it into a car and disappeared. So yeah, sharp shooting um, is certainly one of the Ramola was sharp shot. Um, GMOs, um, I think I would have difficulty 
I think there's a lot of really bad stuff in GMOs, absolutely. And they can always um, put, for example, um, parasites and synthetic self-replicators into food. But um, when you look at chips being in very particular locations, if it's through food, it ha it would, you, know, you would have to explain why it's just one kidney and not the other. You know? right. So I think there's either they actually load them or they load them and then they have some sort of electromagnetic remote steering you know, of these potentially microbots to steer them to some one part of the body. I have no idea. I mean, we have to keep an open mind and be prepared for any sort of modern technology. But I think just through basic consumption, it wouldn't explain the precise locations, you know. And what Melanie found, um, and it was actually startling because, um, you know, we first scanned her and we could, um, I could see with my eye, with actually really basic bug um, detection devices, um, her chips, and then we started scanning me, and I had, um, em, you know, electromagnetic emissions in exactly the same place. And that's when she said, oh, hang on, if, if you have these chips, I know exactly where the next one is. So she puts it down to my neck, and this device goes off again. And she's like, okay, you probably have one in your upper arm, and she puts it, and this device goes off. So, you know, she knew where these things were because she's seen so many victims. But um, people were asking where to get these scans done. And I think um, what, what we'll do as a, as a joint investigation team is we'll put together all the different scans that we have done, which we can tell are you know, leading to success and, and maybe make a little write-up so that people can emulate it. You know? Maybe with contact addresses of people who are willing to offer it or maybe say, you know, like Millicent has done in general, say get a sleep study done and stuff like that. You know? Um, because we have to somehow ship it to the nation and globally so that people can do their own tests. I wonder if it'd be worthwhile if we kind of back engineered this. You know, uh, Catherine, you taught me one thing early on that when they create conspiracy theory, in business language, we call that a business plan. So if they're doing something in the big triangle organizations and these all emanate, from the triangle. Remember, the triangle is the control system of the matrix. They have to use it, they use it all the time. Now, if it's emanating from a control system, a triangle control system, from a business plan, the business plan will uh, follow down through various patterns and various techniques that will be sanctioned by that business plan. So what I'm thinking is that if we're in Europe and we're discovering the same pattern of, of uh, chipping or the same pattern of harassment or the same pattern of gang stalking, can we put these together and follow it back to where the business plan is and who, what the agency is doing what agency is doing that business plan? Because it seems to me that the military, uh, which is mostly in charge of, uh, of Millicent's agony and torture, seems to be different than the more domestic uh, MI5, MI6, European, whoever's running that business plan. Does it make sense to kind of aggregate the different, the different victims so that we can follow back and find the business plan that birthed these torture things? Or am I off base? I don't know. No, I think you're absolutely right. I think you hit, you absolutely hit the nail on the, totally on the head, Paul. I'm so grateful for this because, I mean, first of all, I don't think my torture program in Millicent is different. It is just hers is much more advanced. When she showed the back of the scan of her body, the, the one from Melinda Kidder, there's one location in the right kidney. Now, I have been hit in the right kidney for, I mean, not the past two weeks in Belgium, but all the weeks previously. And Melanie also said something that um, they, are, they are growing some sort of self-replicators in our bodies. And for that, the pH value of the um, kidney, there are two places in the body where they can do this. It's, the, I think, the guts and the kidney. And that's why they might place one of these things into the kidney. So it's all this kind of scientific stuff as well. But the, the kidney is, um, you know, and okay, right, left kidney could be 50% chance, but I also have something going on with my right kidney. Um, so I think mine and Millicent's um, torture program might be very related. They also have been hitting me 
um, in the joints and, and I now discover that they might have been setting off chips because once they hit me very, very hard in a, you know, my right hip and my ankle, after that, my, my, both my hip and my ankle got massively swollen. And, and since then, they were trying to hit me, but as part of a harassment pattern. So you also learn that they do things in series. You know, you never get two things at once. There's always a pattern, and there's also a pattern in time. So I, from the pattern, I can tell that they can set off something remotely in my hip and my ankle, you know? So I think I might, I mean, I might have chips in there as well. Also, Melanie found, um, she said that on her body, she found very fine laser surgery scars. And they look just like, um, like natural, you know, little um, grooves you might have in your skin. When you have to look very carefully, but once you know what you're looking for, you can pick them up. And she immediately saw several of these scars on my arm, which I've never discovered. And they were, you know, hinting at locations where there were emissions as well. Um, and then she showed me she has, it, she also had doctors remove many implants from her body, several from her stomach area, several from her thighs. Um, so this is real, people. It's, it's absolutely horrific. And I have no recollection of ever being implanted. But she says they use, for example, this date rape drug. Um, she, she knows the names of the drugs. They always escape me. But um, it's these kind of standard drugs. Well, hypno. Exactly. Yeah. And there are the two, two other two as well. And she says that people wake up and they've got no recollection of being, um, you know, of, of having anything done to them. But I think if I remember correctly, she said that once she, she kind of woke up in a dazed face and phase and she had the feeling of people actually, um, you know, uh, pushing on her stomach and, and doing something to her stomach. But it's, um, it's, it's horrific because getting these, these chips out of your body, you basically have to, you know, I mean, she says injecting these chips is sometimes you just need a syringe. So you can just easily put, you know, 60 right. chips into people's right. bodies, you know, but then getting them out, it's major surgery, you know. So what we're dealing with is a bunch of absolute total, you know, beyond repair psychopaths. But Paul, to get return to your point, um, based on what, Melanie saw from victims from all around the world, um, based on what I have read from victim statements, also including South Africa and so on. I think um, there might be sub programs, but even the sub programs are identical across the world, you know. So I think we're dealing with one big program here. And, and that means automatically that, I mean, you know, I had dealings with MI5 to my face. And they shot me in the head or maybe set off a chip in the back of my head straight after my first court hearing so that I collapsed in pain. So it's MI5, I'm pretty sure. Um, you know, and I had dealings with the German and with Swiss intelligence. And it, I lived next to the German intelligence headquarters. And the harassment was clearly from them, you know, a kilometer and a half from, you know, from their headquarters. Um, so I have got evidence that... It is definitely German intelligence and definitely um, British and definitely Swiss intelligence who has been harassing me and they have been acting in an identical fashion, which automatically means, Paul, that German intelligence, uh, Swiss and English intelligence, and even you know the intelligence agencies in the US are all part of the same deep capture because they are acting criminally in an identical fashion at the same time. So this means that what I'm fighting here in Switzerland or Germany or in Britain against MI5 is identical to the fight that Karen Stewart has with the NSA and that um, Bill Binney and Kirk Wiebe had with the NSA. We're all fighting the same entity. And as you said, we're seeing the same pyramid you know, hierarchy. But take it one step further, Paul. Um, if it's a global pyramid um, steered program, it also means that there have to be at every level lots and lots of communication traces because this plan has to be communicated from head office down to all the local branches. And I think based on what we see, it is now, and I've said this in the past, but maybe now people see this, you know, for themselves. I think it's fair to say that by now, NSA, MI5, MI6, BND in Germany, and NDB in Switzerland, and also the KGB, because the Russians are doing the same thing. They are just branch officers of the same entity. I, 
hundred percent. As soon as you find, you know, the KGB having a program that's identical to this, and Melanie Richard talked to many um, Russian victims, you know, the KGB is just a branch office of the same entity. And there we are. So, and with this, we can also sweep away all these like prepared, you know, the prepared next prepared puppet show of the U.S. against Russia. It's nonsense. They're the same organization. It's, it's part of the same corporation, if you like. Absolutely. Now, should we try to? These are all branch offices. We know these are all branch offices, and they have to report to some super organization that's that's over them. Uh, how can we how can we try to penetrate that level? I mean, are we are we going interdimensionally? Are we talking about uh, what what possibly could put all of these organizations in deep capture? Um, I'm just one speculation here. Oh, I, I, I don't think we need to speculate. Sorry, Karen, do you want to say something? Uh, no, go ahead. And if it's pertinent after you've, you've finished, then I'll say something. Okay, so I think that this is the beauty, Paul. We don't have to speculate anymore. I think this is, this is why I call this Swiss paper that I mentioned before. It's called, they called it the Network of Global Corporate Control. That's the name of their scientific paper. It has been published by ET, the, the Systems Analysis Department at ETH Zurich. And the name of the um, of these um, uh, mathematicians were Gladfelder, Vitali, and I always forget the third one. Please forgive me. You know, this guy must hate me because I always reference the paper and forget them. But anyway, so it was a 2011 paper, and it's free. The PDF is freely available on archive.org. That's spelled with an S. A I uh, A R X um, I V dot org. If you go into the search and type network of global corporate control, you'll find a 2011 paper. And you, so what we're looking for, Paul, is, a, is a, an entity that is bigger than any one nation state and is pretty big. So it has to be global. It has to be bigger than the US. It has to be bigger than the UK and so on. And this entity, so the Swiss mathematicians identified a cartel, um, an actual um, um, structure hanging together. They analyzed 43,000 global companies, so international companies. They went through the company registers and um, they um, did database analysis on it. So they used sophisticated database tools to map how these companies hang together. They first looked at share ownership as far as that's um, you know, publicly available. Now what the real bombshell was when they looked at company ownership because that showed something that the share um, ownership didn't show. And this is this interlocking structure whereby 40% of these global and international companies are controlled, are part of the same control system. And the way this control system has been up, is set up is by interlocking board membership. And this is really important to understand because share ownership doesn't actually give you that much control. Yes, you might have a shareholder meeting and you might raise some noise, but the real power is the board. And this entity, this organized crime syndicate actually discovered that. So they placed the same corrupt, um, you know, directors, on, uh, I know, corrupt, I can't say that, you know, it doesn't say it in the paper, but they certainly placed the same um, directors onto many companies. And bit by bit, they assembled these interlocking board memberships so that control, the ultimate board control, was flowing towards the same mothership, the same mother company, and from that into bigger companies and so on. And when you analyze this, um, with these data-based um, uh, analysis tools, you discover that 40, imagine 40% 40 of the global corporations hang together and they report to the same thing called the super entity. And I think the, um, the database analysis from the public com company registered registers managed to identify the super entity that controls them all but couldn't quite pin it down because at a certain level it becomes very secretive you know you get money just being siphoned off into you know untraceable and untraceable ways so that's as far as we can say and um the companies that are at the top tier of the super entities include banks insurance companies and stuff like that so they're the top tier 
because they deal with they are even bigger than the the arms dealers because the arms dealers are um, manufacturing industries but what's even more powerful is finance because that's where the you know the the money gets produced the money gets printed if you like so that is the only known entity that qualifies in size to do this so i think it's fair to say that that's the entity that does it and then if you want to find out what is above the level of the publicly documented level you have to go to the documents uncovered and the the actual knowledge of karen stewart and people at the world bank and they map out the, the bit that's above the super entity i think and then and then we get to a uh, to to the very karen top. yeah karen hudis exactly sorry so did i say karen stewart <laughs> sorry sorry i was looking at your image down on the screen no karen hudis exactly and um and people, I think, at the World Bank and the IMF know the owner owners of this very well, you know, they because they're dealing with them. So people in finance at the top tier know who own these corporations, and and I think that is the the ultimate answer. And 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 at the top, it's from from a systems analysis point of view. One of the things that I can say is that um, when you look at one, you take a snapshot in time and you look at the market and you look at the biggest asset owner, unless there's a cataclysmic event, the biggest asset owner will continue to accumulate assets um, at a higher rate than anybody else as a, as a, you know, to do with its size, its dominant position. And therefore the biggest asset owner at one point in time will remain the biggest asset owner and will just grow ever bigger if you go forward in time. So if you want to find out who the biggest asset owner is now, in 2017, you can go back in time and look at the 19th century, what, which entity was the biggest asset holder, or the 18th, or the 16th and 17th century, and it should be the same entity. So even systems analysis also tells us who owns this big corporation, you know, the, the cartel, the syndicate. You can go to history and just pick the biggest asset holder. You know, and in Europe, well, you're looking for an asset holder that's bigger than any one kingdom. Uh, that's some asset holder that holds assets in many countries, and there's only one that comes to question, right? And that's the church. So um, wow. it seems to be that this, and this is exactly what Karen Judas says, you know, she says it's the Vatican. It's the Jesuits, whereby the Jesuits are the, it looks like to me, as I understand it, the military enforcement arm of the top tier of the Vatican. So that, that is, I think, the, the best we can say. And, you know, there were all these things of, oh, conspiracy theories and all the Vatican and so on. But systems analysis and the, the, um, the systems analysis work of these mathematicians at TTH Zurich tell us that, yeah, this is true. These business plans are hugely successful. And, um, I think that's the answer, Paul. I'm not sure. Are you happy with that answer? <laughs> yeah, I'd like to know how they fit in with that. According to John, Dr. John Coleman in his book, uh, he's got a couple of them. One is called uh, Tavistock. The other one is, uh, I can't, can't remember it. But he said that everything reports back to these 13 families. And uh, these 13 families seem to run all the rest of these things now how these corporations fit in with the 13 families i we can only speculate right now uh but there are uh people that are in these 13 families that are work for these families i think they call it it's some type of committee committee of 300 i think it is and the people who run the committee of 300 call themselves olympians now now there you go right there that should be a good laugh. But there, Kissinger, uh, George H.W. Bush was one, and on and on and on, the, the usual suspects there. But is that, a, uh, is that a red herring? Are we going off on another thing? Yeah, this, this other uh, analysis into this global corporation sounds a lot more mathematical and things we can go back to. But uh, I've seen on... Uh, Eric Carlson's website, I think it's under the 911, one of his 911 websites. And he's got the way uh, this committee of 300 report, uh, controls the Rand Corporation and this, this uh, Heritage Foundation 
and all these other, and I bet they control the corporations the same way. I bet we, I bet we can trace it back to these things, and statistically, I, I guess we can trace it back. Yeah, it's, I think you know what the committee of three hundred. I mean, the name already says there are three hundred people. So that's a very, it's a fairly wide ring of con of the control structure, you know. And the question is, is it just one tentacle, or is it the thing, you know? But um, the thirteen families, yes, I've heard about them. Um, I can you name them? Do you know the names, Paul? I think. Sorry, I think you might. There you go. There you go. The names are interesting because. Just like Lucifer, they have a thousand names. Uh, the one name is Cavendish, which is also known as Kennedy, Oppenheimer, um, Bush's maybe, although Bush would be a, a bastardization of another name. But you can get a list of those names uh, through these books that I referenced before. Uh, but the names change. Uh, Kennedy wasn't the original name. I think it was Cavendish or something else and uh, as, as, as time goes by they change the names because you know what's in a name uh, so no I can't name them sorry because um, I mean the, the um, I think uh, Karen Hudas talks about um, a lot of the um, or, or some of the of these people and the people she's talking about have Italian names and again, you go back, you know, so she's talking about the, the top tier, certainly in the financial realm. And, um, you know, why would it be Italian? Well, it's because, I mean, we had the um, Italian bankers. They were, they were the bankers of the, the church. I mean, the church was headquartered in, uh, you know, in the Vatican for, um, well, it's still headquartered in the Vatican again. And that's, that's the, the HQ, you know. So it's the, the HQ of the biggest asset hole. And I want to emphasize that for me, the Vatican is separate from religion, okay? And the reason why it's, it has to be separate, I mean, I'm just talking as a systems analyst, it's because the church started off as an organization. They're organized churches. They had their organization of bishops and pastors and so on. Also, again, a pyramid hierarchy that has been around for centuries, you know, millennia. Now, any pyramid hierarchy gets deep captured by psychopaths after a century for sure so anything that has been around for centuries will be the original organization as much as it is recognizable with a really thick layer of total psychopaths at the top who are only after the power and they don't care what they are doing if they're selling religion or selling products they just want power and this is how I think even the church, you know, especially the church because it's so old, is in deep capture. And when you have an organization in deep capture, it doesn't do what it says on the tin anymore because it's just acting, you know. And this is why if when I, you know, start going on about the Vatican, I'm just talking as a systems analyst. And people have to understand I'm not attacking their belief or, you know, their, their connection with Jesus Christ. I think Jesus Christ was exactly, you know, going on about it, that you shouldn't be, you know, listening to the, to the priests and the temples. You should find God yourself. He was talking about the decentralized model. Everybody, you know, has God in them and the connection to God. If you now go to a big hierarchy, you know, with priests and pastors and bishops and so on, you know, the same effects have been at work millennia ago, it will always be deep captured by organized criminals and psychopaths because these, these um, pyramid hierarchies at the top just offer so much power. And um, one of the things that I found really shocking, it's just very recent that I even heard about it, um, the Vatican has got something, um, a building, uh, a, a hall, like a, um, a kind of an auditorium or you know, um, congregation hall that was, I think, built in the 1970s and it's called the Nervi Hall. And that's spelled N-E-R-V-I, Nervi Hall, after the architect, I think, who did that. And that building is entirely in the shape of a snake's head. Right? I've, seen that. I've seen that. Wow. Now, if, you're, if you think that the Vatican has anything to do with Jesus Christ, this does make no sense. Anybody can put Nervi Hall into Google and see that when you're inside the, the, this auditorium, it really looks like you either, depending on how you, you know, visualize it, you're either inside a snake's head or you have a snake staring down at you as you're sitting in the auditorium. 
you know, it's freakish. It has two eyes on the side, two windows that look like snake's eyes. The actual glass inside is such that it looks like, you know, the kind of um, shimmering side eyes of a snake. And then the little auditorium at the front has two columns that are very broad at the top and get narrow, and they look like two fangs. And in the middle is a red, um, you know, carpet, and it looks like a long tongue, you know, a snake's tongue sticking out. So you couldn't make it more like a snake's head if you tried. And as someone pointed out, nowhere in this hall is, is that any crucifixes or references to Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ does not reside in that. That's why, you know. Right. And what this is, is the Vatican putting on, on show in the 1970s that they are the snake's head. Now, what the hell is the snake? The snake is this long, it's what I think, um, um, so uh, Catherine Austin Fitz refers to the um, tapeworm economy, and she, she discovered, you know, as the um, Assistant Secretary for Housing, that money seems to be siphoned off into a black budget. It's like, a, you know, something sucking money away, like a parasite is sucking nutrients. And that's why she says there's a tapeworm at the heart of the U.S. economy, and it's taking resources and it's siphoning them off to somewhere. And there are other people who have said, for example, the um, inland revenue money in the U.S. is being siphoned off to the city of London and from there to the Vatican. That doesn't make any sense unless you know that the corporation has it's also one of its um, sites in the city of London. It's called the Square Mile. And that is the City of London Corporation. It's ancient. It goes back to, I think, before, you know, William the Conqueror. That is the corporation. It, the, the City of London site belongs to the corporation. It's a tax-free zone, I think, as, as I understand it. They make their own tax laws. And the Queen visits, I think, the site in a ritual every year. And she has to leave her bodyguards behind at the, um, you know, the border to the City of London. And then it's taken over by the you know, the, the bodyguards um, given to her by the guilds, you know. So it sounds totally wacky, you know, why the hell would something like that exist? Well, this is the big corporation we're talking about. And um, why would the money from the City of London be said to be siphoned off to the Vatican? Well, because the City of London is another little, you know, branch of the Vatican. And by the way, so is Washington, D.C. District of Columbia is also private land. You know, it is, and, and the Vatican, the city of London, and Washington, D.C. are part of what's called, as I understand it, the three-city state. And they've got a flag, which is, has three red stars for the three cities. Now, what this is, is like three, the three HQ branches, you know, but the money between D.C., the city of London, and the Vatican is sloshing around in one, you know, inofficial big circle, and, and the head of this snake, you know, that's taking resources from the UK through the city of London, from the entirety of the US via DC and the, the tax money is being siphoned off to the head of the snake that feeds on it, which is the Vatican. You know, and when you, that, that is to the best of my knowledge how the system works. And then suddenly when, you, when you've mapped this out, a lot of things make sense. It suddenly makes sense that the, the Vatican is all about bling a bling bling, right? They've got all the gold and they are, you know, waving it around. And meanwhile, you think, hang on, we've got all these people starving in Africa. Should you be waving golden wands here? You know, or would we, could we possibly find a better use for that money than a golden stick? You know, but no, the church doesn't care, right? We've got all these churches blinged up, a lot of resources, certainly a huge networks globally that could be mobilized to solve problems, yet they do not. Well, they do not because they're in deep capture, you know. And we've got exactly the same thing. We've got the FBI, you know, army intelligence being contacted by us saying these people are being, you know, tortured. They do nothing, nothing. Why? It doesn't make any sense. The FBI is a freaking police force as well as an intelligence agency. If they're not interested, who the hell should be? Yet they do nothing. And that's because they're in deep capture. And that's why, you know, and suddenly also other things make sense. Why would a guy called, um, I think he was called the banker of God or God's banker. I forget the Italian name, but a guy who was running what's called, you know, very high up in the Vatican Bank. He was found hanging off Blackfriars Bridge in London. Why London? Well, it's because he was visiting the branch office called the City of London Corporation. That's why. 
he was bumped off there yeah. you know and then also suddenly it makes a lot of sense that you have these obelisks you've got an obelisk in dc very spectacularly you know the big whatever it's called you've got an identical one in the vatican and you've got an identical well albeit smaller one in london in the city of london as well right washington and monument exactly that's it the washington yeah. monument and what that shows is again the control architecture and, and um, it, it, this is how we get back to it, Paul, because the, if you look at the obelisk, at the very top, it's a pyramid. But then lower down, it's, it's tapering very, very slowly. And that's because beyond a certain level, you have um, psychopaths controlling psychopaths, controlling psychopaths like that. Uh -huh. And you can't have one layer of psychopaths outnumbering the ones who control them, or they will just kill them, you know? So you have to have a, a very equally balanced thing. So you have to have this very long tower where, you know, the, the number of psychopaths controlling the younger psychopaths, you know, is almost balanced, not quite. And you've got this huge tower that only slowly gets bigger. And one layer of psychopaths knows the layer one up and maybe the layer one up, but they don't really know who's even above that. You know, there's a lot of secrecy. And that is it. The obelisk is the control architecture. And it, it has inscribed in it everything we said, everything you said about the psychopaths putting um, organizations in deep capture, Paul, that's inscribed in the obelisk. It explains its shape, you know. Well, that's amazing. I could talk about how the church got started and how I think it was deep capture from the beginning. That yeah. Catholic church, because I think it was started, uh, actually, it was made a, uh, an institution by Constantine. Constantine took it on as his control mechanism for uh, going forward to control a vast empire that he couldn't control with soldiers. So he had to control it with ideology. So he adopted this ideology that was growing quickly. But back in the day, you couldn't become a Constantine or an emperor, unless you were following the Church of Babylon, which was worshiping the snake again. Uh, so we have the church from the beginning was put in deep capture by Constantine, as far as I can see. Uh, he became a Christian on his deathbed, supposedly, because he didn't want to become a Christian before, because he had to do a lot of bad things that emperors have to do. I, I, think, the, I think it would have been bad for business had you become a Christian. It would have been, right, it would have been bad for business. And one of the first things they did is they reverted the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday, which was the old Babylonian religion worshiping the sun uh, holy day. So it's been a deep capture from the beginning. It's just now, since they have technology, they can get into all our heads, they can supposedly uh, roll this thing out. They've never been able to do it before, I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, and it's not like they haven't wanted to. Uh, they seem to be set up uh, to do worse things than they've ever been able to. Well, they're doing worse things than I can imagine them ever doing before because they have technology. Uh, so I think it's really interesting how we uh, trace that back. We know who to point the finger at now. And now all we need to do is turn the earth key, oath keepers over to uh, sick them on these guys at the top, and we've got it done. No, I'm just kidding about that. But uh, uh, good analysis, Karen. Plane was going over, so I turned off my mic. Okay, did you have a comment, Karen? I know that you... You're, you're, I know you've got stuff to say on this. Uh, <laughs> um, hmm. Well, I think I'll just, uh, I'll let you continue for the moment, you know. Uh, part, of, part, of, part of what you were saying was blocked by an airplane going over, which is why yeah. I had the mic off. But as Karen said before, this doesn't demean Christianity or Jesus Christ. This uh, points to an organization in deep capture an organization that's trying to, actually everybody knows about the one world religion that's being put together by the Pope and yeah. uh, uh, everything. And we've got a, uh, 
a Muslim mayor in uh, London. Uh, really? That's a, that's a collection of bad ideas, I'll tell you that one. I'm not sure that, uh, that Muhammad himself felt that he was possessed by demons. He's, of course, a pedophile, uh, of course, a mass murderer, and a torturer. So that religion is ensconced as uh, one of the, uh, well, it's charge of the, he's in charge of the city of London. Well, uh, so actually, no, actually he isn't, he isn't. This is, um, this is the, um, this is careful, to, we have to be very careful because London, as in Greater London, the city is totally different from the city of London. It's so important. People get this wrong. When you say, I'm going to yeah. London, you're going yeah. to Greater London. No one of, I think 3,000 people live in the city of London, the actual city of London corporation territory. And I tell you, don't just move to the city of London. You know, the people who are there, they're there for a reason, I think. Maybe they rent it out to some people to make money, but, you know, otherwise. It's owned by the guilds of the City of London Corporation, otherwise I think known as the Crown Corporation. Um, now, but it's so important to understand because um, the person you mentioned, he's in charge of Greater London. He has nothing to do with the guilds. And um, another thing that I'm learning because, you know, I mean, my best friend is a Muslim, is that, again, we have to be so careful about um, taking the psychopaths away who have been throughout the millennia always trying to get huge correct connections of people and then controlling them with whatever brainwash suited them, you know? And I think it's so careful, we have to be careful because, um, I mean, Christianity is not short of killing psychopaths. <laughs> By no means. Look at the, you know, crusades, you know? So I, I what I try to do is um, actually take it, really break it down and, and try to, um, you know, separate the wheat from the chaff. And one of the things I would like to point out is look carefully at the joint investigation team, you know, because I, it was my suggestion to the ladies to found this joint investigation team. And at the, at the time, I probably didn't make it clear to them why they were chosen, why I wanted them on my team. But now I can say, because it fits perfectly into today's show, look at them. We have, they represent the five key aspects that have been put into deep capture. We are still lacking a medic, but otherwise, Karen Stewart saw the deep capture of the intelligence agency. Now, Millicent, she is a doctor of ministry. She actually, maybe without knowing, by representing true faith and the way she talks about religion, she is actually fighting the deep capture in the church. Even if she doesn't know it, that's what she does. She represents. You know it. There you are. You know, because she, when I spoke to her, I saw that she has a direct link to Jesus Christ. That's that's what I'm looking for. Now, Karen Stewart is the most honest person in the NSA, and she went right up against the deep capture. Ramola, on the other hand, she is fighting the deep capture of the press. She has been going solo because she represents true journalism. That's it. You know, she does what a journalist should do. Now, Melanie Richan founded a human rights organization, and she, without noticing, she's fighting the deep capture and the infiltration of all the human rights organizations. And she is standing up for victims as somebody who runs a human rights organization should. You know, and meanwhile, I got totally disgusted by the behavior of my colleagues. I also know from you know talking to other people that there's deep capture going on in the sciences and that people are being farmed out for research. So I'm here to take up the battle against my science colleagues and, and fight deep capture in the sciences. So there we are. These are the, you know, the five pillars. We're still, you know, we, we, we could do with a lawyer and a doctor, but otherwise, you know, this is the best I could do. And this is why the women who I've chosen to be on this team are on this team, because every single one of them has a role. And Catherine, let's add that Paul and Mindy are there to kind of help us to stay focused. Oh, and the psychology, Paul, you know, you are actually, you know, Thank you. you also mentioned the, the, the deep caption psychology and psychiatry. That's, that's your area, you know. Kind of tangentially, anyway. anyway. And I, we, were, we were talking to uh, Lydia last night. And she brings forth the deep capture 
of the American spiritual community, the spiritual community that used to occupy the land and now the United States has taken over and transformed into something else. And she gives a good account of how powerful the spiritual culture was and how much of a threat it was to the, uh, the reptile organization from the Vatican. By the way, if you want to see uh, information about this hall that Catherine was talking, or Catherine was talking about, there's a guy named Ed, and he has a channel called Outer Dark. And I find he's he's, he's so incredible to me because I love his accent, and uh, he really can get in deep, uh, more deeply than I can even follow. But he's got a few videos on. We'll try to link link them below this. Uh, that he's done on exploring the architecture in this one building. Anyway, so I, I just thought that Lydia is bringing forth another another aspect. She's not in a committee, but she had we have interviewed her, and she does explain how they've uh, been put that organization that put that uh, put the American uh, spiritual Indian connection with the land, connection with nature, how they put that into deep capture. Also, awesome. You know, and that, that has also been, as far as I can tell, exactly that, because exactly the same thing has also been done to the people of Africa, to the people of Latin America, also to the people of China, for example, ancient Chinese medicine that is, you know, um, has a lot of herbal remedies, very powerful, you know, sometimes in certain respects, more powerful than the pharmaceutical industry. You know, everywhere around the world, it's exactly the same thing. And um, what we saw in the, um, you know, the nations of Latin America, Africa, and in any region of the world, is you have a local population that survived throughout the millennia. So in the system is inscribed a lot of information and knowledge, you know, and, um, and a certain way of viewing the world and, and living in harmony with the world um, that allows them to survive. Had they not done that, they wouldn't have survived that long. And now come along a corporation that has no local roots, no local connection, very little um, understanding of the local um, you know, botany or you know, the land, and is trying to do the same sort of pattern that it, um, it uh, kind of perfected in the Industrial um, Revolution and it's, it's things that it can deal with animals and, and, and especially people as if it was a, um, a factory, you know. And it's doing the same sort of factory approach. And, and it has absolutely devastated, as far as I can tell, the world. So I think this battle that we're fighting, I mean, the, the people who are fighting the pedophile networks, the people who are fighting, um, you know, Monsanto and um, the war machinery, the people who are fighting World War Three, and, and us who are fighting the intelligence agencies, we are all fighting the same corporation. And what the 21st century battle is about, and Karen Hughes does the same thing, it is the, the breakup of the corporation. That's it. It has circumvented the, um, the, the what are they called, the kind of cartel regulations of all the um, countries through these interlocking board memberships because people were looking at share um, ownership and stuff like that. And, and um, it kind of went through under the radar. Um, but now we know it exists. Now we know who is doing it. And if you look carefully, for example, I mean, I know for a fact about the British heads of intelligence, they are, it's, they are doing what's called a re revolving door. They are changing from being heads of MI6 to working for banks and working for BP. You know, how come? Well, it's not just that, um, you know, it's, it's convenient to BP to have a, a, an ex-head of MI6 on their books, you know, for a bit of local knowledge. No, these people are just rotating between branches of the same entity. They continue working for the same corporation. That's it. That's just it, you know. But just briefly, I wanted to share my screen and actually show you an image of, um, hang on, um, of Nervy Hall. Um, it's, hang on, it's this one here. Um, I'm not sure if you can see it, but um, you have the eyes on the right and the left, and then in, you have these little pillars here and there, and even the, the roof tiling is such that you can see, um, it looks like the, the scales of a snake, and look at the, the eyes and how that's done, you know, with the little darker tile in there, and these are the fangs, this clearly represents fangs. Little holes that, you know, also look very similar to the... There's no reason other than this. 
other than to show it's a snake. And of course, the Pope shows up in exactly the middle of the mouth. He's the mouthpiece of the snake. Exactly. Uh, oh. Horrific, isn't it? Oh, yes, it is. You it's know, when I, my very first uh, seminary class was Hebrew Bible. And the first assignment messed me up so bad because, well, we had to uh, research the early writers of the Hebrew Bible. And all of them but one were Nazi sympathizers. So, Catherine, you are right on. <laughs> they are so right. hidden and so covered up. We may never know the truth. Now you know why. Now you know why. And also, yes. there's, there's there's a there's a Swiss historian called Sean Cross, and he's been um he's from South Africa and he lives in Switzerland and he's been mapping out the control structure, and he was he. Um, goes into the symbols and um, he has mapped out um, he says that the enforcement arm is called octagon um, because it's an octagon and then there's a the squares you know as you're going up in this kind of control architecture they've got different symbols for themselves and the police forces he points out have usually um, you know octagonal hats traditionally and so on because they're part of the same global um, control structure um, but um, you know, he also talks about how the Nazis were funded out of Switzerland, how, how Mao, um, you know, the, the Chinese communist leader was educated in Switzerland. So there are all these links to Switzerland and it's very hard to understand why unless you um, go back in history and he mapped out that when Switzerland was founded, that was exactly, I think, three weeks or something like that, or three or four weeks or six weeks, something like that, after the final fall of Jerusalem when it was taken from the Knights Templar. And he says the Knights Templar were a horde of mercenaries, and then when they were kicked out of Jerusalem, they were coming back, and they were, you know, Knights Templar, they were, you know, in the employ of the church. And these hordes of brutal, psychopathic, serial killing soldiers had to be somehow contained. And they were given Switzerland as, as their territory. And he says, this is how Switzerland was founded. And it, it's, it's the home of the, the, the Templars, you know? And what they were is what they did after that. And if you go through history, you have these incursions. You have the, um, I think the 30 year war and so on, where, you know, a couple of hundred thousand Swiss mercenaries murdered millions of Germans and so on. And he says these were incursions in the surrounding areas for asset accumulation. It would rob the lands and then retreat back to Switzerland behind the mountains and then, you know, have them up here. And, um, and it also follows from that, that um, most of the, the wealth, you know, the Nazi loot got to Switzerland. Switzerland was the only area um, that wasn't attacked in the Second World War. Oh, sorry, I, I think I can hear your microphone, Paul. Um, I, and I yeah, know, we don't know. Karen seems to have dropped out. We we're just wondering whether she's there. Yeah, I think she's, when she's attacked, she, um, you know, her phone doesn't work. Yeah, um, and I was—I was just. Her call had ended. Hmm? It said that her call had ended. Oh. oh. Well, I can tell you that the octopus is a major symbol of the control system. Uh, also, Switzerland has CERN, which I think is deeply satanic and, and connected with the, could we call it the reptile system? Also, have, did you see the uh, the open the ceremony opening the Goddard Tunnel? Uh, I think you're right in the belly of the beast there, uh, Catherine. I am. I absolutely am. And um, the, actually, the Goddard Tunnel has a second function, I think, because it is um, a freight train connection, I think, as I understand, um, between, you know, I mean, northern Italy and Switzerland. So it's connecting Germany to um, Italy. So it allows the very fast transport of, of um, huge amounts of stuff. So, hmm, trains. Where have you heard trains before? Well, wasn't it the case that um, Warren Buffett bought some huge train um, connecting the width of the U.S. or something like that recently? Because if you are speeding... Karen is calling back in, I think. Mindy, can you pick it up? I'm going to give it a try. Let's see how to do it. Let me try this. 
Karen. Where's Karen calling? Is she calling you, Millicent, or Mindy? Well, my phone was ringing, but it was ringing on uh, Hangouts. Right. Or maybe Karen by accident tried to call you and not Mindy or something like that. Maybe send her an, an, an ex, a, another invite. That's what we just did. We'll see yeah. if that works. We'll see if that well, did. Actually, you know what, Paul, the, um, the Goddard Tunnel, I think. Oh, there she is. There she is. Karen, we were just talking about the um, satanic ceremony that opened the Goddard Tunnel in Switzerland and the role of Switzerland in all this. And um, um, I was talking about how the fun, according to the historian Sean Cross, the, the foundation of Switzerland has to do with the Knights Templar being kicked out of Jerusalem. And um, Switzerland was founded ex the exact number of weeks that it takes to ride on horseback from, from Jerusalem back to Switzerland. And then Switzerland was founded here. But um, then there's the satanic um, ceremony opening the Goddard Tunnel. And... Um, I think the, the Goddard Tunnel is also important because it allows the fast movement of, um, of stuff from between Italy and Germany. And um, I think it's also related to, for example, Warren Buffett buying a train line across the width of the US, if I'm informed correctly. Now, you want to use trains. Yeah, you can make huge profits if you're on train line if there is a war because heavy duty equipment and soldiers have to be transported. So the Goddard tunnel, the satanic um, you know, um, opening to do with war and death and Satan and giving rebirth and blah, 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 blah. You know, and also Warren Buffett buying the train line seemed to indicate to me that yes, what's planned is a world war in Europe and the US and these people want to profit from it, I think. Good. I really have to bring this thing to an end. Like all the uh, techno crime fighter forums in the past, this was a bombshell. I'm still reeling from the information we were able to put together and generate. You three are amazing researchers and you're strong fighters for, for the cause. It seems like... system there's, that there's no way to defend against it. But I, I would remind you that their biggest fear, the thing that can, can tear them apart more than anything is truth. And as long as we keep generating the truth, as long as we keep unearthing the truth, the more we keep exposing them, the more vulnerable they are. So And uh, have a little sign off, say what you want to say, and then we'll call it a wrap on this Techno Crime Fighters Forum. Uh, Millicent, would you like to start? Well, I would just like to continue in what I was saying about um, the effort that it takes to prove that you've been illegally implanted and how they are able to torture uh, people in their own homes. We are set up as torture chambers. Um, take it for yourself, uh, a police sergeant stood on my front porch and told me when you go to the hospital, when you have to go to surgery, they put implants in you. Um, I called a, a, an FBI, uh, actually the FBI uh, terrorism division in Memphis, Tennessee, and the person that I spoke with on the phone said, we know whose chips are on. So, you know, that's pretty pretty clear that the government, not just the government, but law enforcement knows about people being illegally implanted and that is being used to cause them harm. Great, great. Thank you very much, Dr. Millicent Black. Karen? Uh, well, I'm probably gonna go off on a evangelical tangent at just very briefly and say that in Ephesians 2.2, 2, I believe, it talks about Satan being the god of the airwaves. And having studied uh, end times prophecy on and off, I tell you, I never imagined that that included directed energy weapons or the concept of them. So I would like to say, I think that what we're looking at is 
basically what the Bible talks about is nearly destroying the world before Christ comes back. But I think right now, things did not go according to satanic plan and that God stepped in and we do have a grace period. And I think we need to make the most of it. And I think that if we look and decide that, yes, God has stepped in and he is, he is holding back evil and allowing us to fight the good fight. And we need to make sure that we are on his side and not claim he's on ours. We need to make sure we are on his side. And I think we will prosper and we will win and we will push back for as long as the grace period lasts. And I don't know whether that's a few months or whether that's the end of my lifetime. I mean, I'm 60, so 10, 20 years maybe, uh, 10, 20 months maybe, I don't know. But I am encouraged and I tell people, if you have been discouraged, Drop that. Be encouraged and look to God and ask, what is your place here? Because he knew every single one of us was going to be here, alive, wow. in this unique wow. time in history. And it was no accident. So if you're sitting there being uh, feeling sorry for yourself, no, you have a purpose. That's your right. job is to find it. Your job is to ask on your knees, what is my purpose? Because you have me here for a reason. I am that's not an accident. Good. That's good. So that's what I wanted to say. Wow. That's, that's fantastic. Thank you very much, Karen. Catherine, the See, last I'm, word. Yes. I, I, well, I would like to honor this because um, what Millicent and um, what Karen said is, is really powerful. And um, actually, I find it incredibly powerful. And, and I'm an atheist. And I will explain why. Because... When I talked to Karen and Millicent I, and also Ramola, I discovered that we are all saying the same thing. We're just using different words. So when they're saying God stepped in and, and everything they described, the process and how it has been <clears throat> described in the past and we're now living it, <clears throat> as an atheist, I, I'm saying exactly the same thing. I'm just using different words. And it's, it's actually beautiful to see that what I'm saying is 100% mirrored by exactly what they're saying. So I will say everything that they said in my own words which is, as far as I can tell, as a physicist, that um, what they call God, I call the laws of physics. And it's beautiful because they're ancient and no one can ever break them. No one can go against the will of God. So for me, physics, the laws of physics are what they call the, you know, the will of God, as far as I can tell. And the laws of physics say is that this system is going to be wound up. And there are certain processes I can tell at work um, call it rebound, call it uh, system inertia, but I'll call it, you know, forces, restorative forces. And they are not just, they haven't just kicked in. They are getting ever more powerful by the day. And I could tell that when I was in Belgium, because we suddenly managed to recruit people at the university to help us. We found police officers who were totally on our side and they were willing to help us. So what we're now seeing is that people are coming together um, and what, what um, also what Millicent and Karen said is that people have to, they, they have a purpose here on this planet and they have to find what it is. I can say as a, as a systems analyst, that's 100% true. We have been misguided to believe that little people don't matter. But that's wrong because we're dealing with nonlinear systems, highly complex nonlinear systems, where sometimes a sentence, a tweet from somebody can go viral and can change opinion. So little people can have a huge impact. They can actually, that's the truth that the world leaders don't want us to know is that a private person can change the course of history. And I want everybody to know that. That is, they, you know, my colleagues call it the will of God. I call it the laws of physics, but the, the outcome is exactly the same. So everything that they said is true. And I want everybody to now stand up and decide whose side they're on, who they want to support, because really the smallest thing will make a difference and will change history. Wow. Thank you very much. And this is the end of episode nine of the Techno Crime Fighters Forum. Thank you very, very much. And thank you for watching. And thank everybody in the chat. Bye-bye. <laughs>